Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to have you worshiping with us here at Faith Bible Church. It's good to be back. I want to take a minute and thank Pat Kennedy for bringing the word last week. I pray that you were blessed by his message in Luke 15, reminding us just about the passionate pursuit of the Father for the lost. And I pray that we would all recognize and remember uh, that we too once were lost, and the Father will pursue until he brings those lost sheep home. Uh, we had a great time at, uh, in Asheville uh, celebrating Kelly's sister's wedding. It was great to get some time away and just kind of refresh and recharge, but it's also good to be back, and we are going to dive right in to the message in Ezra. Uh, we've been traveling through this book for some time. We're going to continue traveling through it for the next several weeks, and I pray that it blesses, but also encourages and challenges your heart to see how God works in mysterious ways. And this morning, we are sort of in a transitional part of the book. We have been talking about essentially the reestablishment of the temple, uh, the worship of God, but we've also been talking about the opposition that God's people endured because of their desire to remain faithful to what God had commanded. We are essentially at the pinnacle of that effort. And after this, we transition into chapter 7. And really, the following chapters discuss then the continued desire of Ezra for God's people to utilize, essentially, the Word of God in their acts of worship. What's interesting is, at that time, we discover also the heart of God's people had deepened to a greater joy and a greater blessing in God. But how did they get there? And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. We're going to ask a question, is it possible to experience deep joy when I worship God? Simple question, isn't it? And obviously we might say, yeah, it is. But I want to follow up with another statement. Yes, it is possible to experience deep joy when you worship God. However, sometimes God must take us through a path of hardship so that we might experience deep joy in Christ. I want to just ask a question of you this morning. How many of you have gone through something challenging after having come to Jesus? I see just about everybody's head nodding. And it's interesting because there's this weird juxtaposition of joy and hardship when we work in our relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't think it's a very popular message to go out and stand on a street corner and tell people, hey, come to Jesus so that you can experience deep joy through hardship. It doesn't sell well, does it? It doesn't sound attractive. We want the message of come to Jesus and experience deep joy. But here's what I want to ask. For those of you that have gone through hardship and turned in to God, where's your relationship now? There is a deeper joy, isn't there? And so one of the things that we're going to see this morning, and one of the things that I want to encourage you all in as we watch what God is doing to bring about a deeper relationship with the people of God so that they more authentically express their faith in Him, so that by expressing more authentically their faith in Him, those that are around the people of God begin to say, hey, there's something to this God and they too begin to see that there's a difference that God makes, and it's because of the hardship that the people of God endured, God is glorified. And that's something that I want to speak to you this morning. You know, as we look around, um, I don't know that you really would want to tell somebody, come to Jesus and then experience hardship so that you can experience deep joy in Jesus. But also, I think it's important for us to see as we travel back and see what's going on in the story of Ezra, how God is bringing about a deeper relationship for his people through opposition, through challenge, through struggle, and through strife. So that by doing so, again, the people of God's relationship is more authentic, it's more real, and there is a deeper joy in Jesus. Summatively, essentially, what I'm saying is this. 
We all don't want to be weak, do we? Naturally, inside of ourselves, our culture does not celebrate weakness. But then how do we get to truly revere the message of Jesus and the message of Paul? When I am weak, he is strong. See, we can placate that, we can state that, we can command that, we can put that out, but it's not until we understand our weakness, until we go through something challenging, until we are at a point where there is nothing of us and only God, that we experience the true strength of God. And then by experiencing the true strength of God, that brings about a greater joy, what? when we worship him. So this morning, that's what we're going to be looking at. We've asked this question, is it possible to experience deep joy when I worship God? And we're going to essentially answer that with this following statement. Yes, it is possible to experience deep joy when you worship God. However, sometimes God might take us through a path of hardship so that we might experience deep joy in Christ. Friends, what I want to tell you is this. I can probably summarize our lives by the following statement. We are either going into a time of hardship, in the middle of a time of hardship, or coming out of one. And what I want to tell you is, is that those are the moments where God is working in our lives to draw us closer to Him. And we have a choice of whether or not we either turn into Him or away from Him. But also what I want to encourage you in is in those moments of hardship, as we turn into God, that's where we see just how reliable, how strong, how good, how blessed we are because of Him and not ourselves. So when you are experiencing hardship, that's where I want to go with you this morning. And the first thing that I want to tell you summatively about the book of Ezra is this. Remember that amid the chaos, okay? Dot, dot, dot. That's the first point that I want to make. Why do I say remember amid the chaos? Any of you out there going through a hard time right now? You don't have to acknowledge it, but I'm going to ask, does it feel like you are going through chaos? Does it feel like you don't have an understanding of what's going on and why God is doing or not doing what you think he should do or not do? Let's take a moment and let's pause there. Because all through the first part of the book of Ezra, on a worldly level, it would look very chaotic. We discover in the book of Ezra, as I've said before, that the people of God were worshiping God and they were doing okay. But over time, the people of God began to move toward worshiping idols. It was a little bit of God and a whole lot of other things. So, through the prophet Isaiah and others, they come forward and they say, hey, we just want to let you know that you better shape up. And if you don't, God is going to bring about an army that is going to put you into exile. We've seen this and we've talked about it, and it's amazing how what we see prophesied actually occurs in the book of First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and then is sort of summarized, or the results of that, are established in the book of Ezra. So God says, I'm going to bring about the Babylonian army. They're going to essentially take over. They're going to take you from your home, put you into exile, and they're going to destroy the place of where you worship. And the people of God, you would think at that time, would say, oh, okay, let's figure this out. Let's behave. But they don't. And time goes by, and the people of God think that Isaiah was just some loony person to the point that they think that maybe they don't really need to trust what God says. And then, lo and behold, guess what happens? The Babylonian army does come, and Nebuchadnezzar does conquer the people of God and place them into exile. And we have to remember, that is essentially as if right now an army were to invade Panora and to take us out of this place of worship, to place us in a foreign land, and not have the ability to worship God of how we do today. It's that disruptive. But also God says, I have a heart for you, 
I am a restorative God. I am a relational God. And I'm also going to tell you that even though this will occur after a period of 70 years, I'm going to bring about another army that is going to take over the Babylonian army. And by that army taking over the Babylonian army, you're going to have disruption again, but then you're going to be moved back to your home. And sure enough, what happens? The Medo-Persian army comes under King Cyrus and they conquer the Babylonian army and the people of God begin to return home because of a decree that the King Cyrus makes, allowing them to establish and reestablish their homeland and rebuild the temple. If it's not chaotic enough, the people of God begin to rebuild the temple and the Samaritans come forward and they say, hey, we see you're rebuilding the temple. Now the Samaritans are the people who worshipped God, but when things got rough, they ran away from God and they didn't suffer any of the consequences of worshipping God. Now that the people of God are back, they want to join in the worship of God. But the problem is, is that those individuals were the one that began to pollute the authenticity of the worship of God pre-exile. They come forward and they say, hey, we can help out. We've got resources, we've got ideas, we've got people, we've got money, we've got funds. Let us join in in the rebuilding of the temple. Sounds good, doesn't it? But the people of God know what God has said, and they also know how they got there in the first place. And so what do they say? No, thank you. They remain obedient to the command of God. And the minute that they remain obedient to the command of God, you would think that what? Everything would be great. Okay, great. They're obedient to God. Perfect. The temple's rebuilt. Everything's fine. Everybody's happy. We all sing kumbaya. There are no challenges. But on a worldly level, what happens is, is that for their obedience, chaos turns even more chaotic. Because the Samaritans now begin to oppose the people of God in their re rebuilding. But now, because of the obedience of the people of God, not only do the Samaritans oppose what's going on, but all of the people around the people of God oppose the rebuilding of the temple. They're doing everything they can to disrupt and distort and destroy the ability for the people of God to worship. We get to the point where things aren't going very well. We realize that essentially this disruption lasts for about 15 to 22 years. And I want to make that point because sometimes we experience opposition and we think it's going to be for a day, we think it's going to be for a week, we think it's going to be for a month, we think it's going to be for a year, and then it goes for 5, 10, or 15. And what I want to ask you lovingly but quite seriously is this. We're not very patient people, are we, with God? We experience hardship or opposition, and it goes more than our timeline. What do we begin to do? We begin to doubt him, don't we? We begin to doubt his providence. We begin to doubt his sovereignty. We begin to wonder where he is. But then interestingly enough, as we see, lo and behold, King Cyrus, who issues this decree, is no longer king. People kind of wonder, well, what's going to happen? We move into a new kingship. And then we bring about even a third king, King Darius. And the people of God are experiencing opposition to the point where what they do is, is they say this. We've been told from other people that we are the ones who are disrupting the kingdom. But what we want to tell you is this. All we're doing is what we've been told by King Cyrus several years ago. They don't try to woo their way in. They don't try to finagle their way in. They don't try to bribe their way in. They don't try to politic their way in. They trust what God has done. And they say, this is what we were told. And this is what we are doing. And we're going to trust that when you go back and look in your records, you will find that decree from Cyrus, and you will discover that all we're doing is honoring the kingdom and honoring our God. And that's so important, 
Because in that moment, the people of God could have said, well, we're doing this, but also, hey, here's $20 to go and to maybe change things in our direction. Or, hey, maybe if we do a couple of things, it will work out. They didn't do any of that. They just say, go look for it, completely trusting that God will take care of them. And I want to emphasize that what could have happened was those people who got the message could not have taken it to Darius. They could have taken it to Darius, and Darius could have said, nah, we're not going to worry about it. This is too political. Let's shut down what the people of God are doing. It also could have been that Darius could have said, yeah, we'll pretend like we'll go and look for this decree, and we just will say, you know, we searched high and low everywhere, but we just couldn't find it. We don't know what you're talking about. Or they could have found it, read it, and discovered that the people of God were doing what they said, but for political reasons, Darius could have changed the decree and said, yeah, we found it, but actually this is what it said. And the reason I bring all of this up is all of those possibilities could have occurred amidst this chaotic time. But God in his sovereignty is overseeing the events of God's people, bringing about the restoration of his people so that they might worship him. But also in the restoration of his people, establishing a deeper joy of worship in the people of God so that they might worship him truthfully, wholly, and fully. So the letter comes, and sure enough, Darius says, we found it, and you're right. That's simply the summary. We found the letter, and you are right. And so here's the deal. Go build your temple, and P.S., by the way, because of what's going on, you're going to be aided in materials, money, and giving. Now, we look and we say, wow, praise Darius, right? No, praise God. Because what God is doing through Darius is saying, because of your obedience, because you've endured hardship, I'm going to bless you beyond measure. I'm going to give you more than what you originally thought you would get. But friends, to get there, what was the road that they had to travel? And I want to put emphasis on this because I know several of you are going through hard times. And I know sometimes what we do is we begin to question God. But what I would encourage you in is rather than questioning God, turn into him. And in those weak moments, in those times where there is none more of yourself, don't let the world overcome you. Say, yeah, I am weak, but I worship a God who is strong. Remember that amid the chaos, God is working. And that's where we turn today in Ezra 6, the final part, verse 19. As the people of God culminate essentially with the greatest celebration they have at that time, which is the Passover. On the 14th day of the first month, the exiles celebrated the Passover the priests and Levites had purified themselves, and all were ceremonial clean. The Levites slaughtered the Passover lamb for all of the exiles, for their brothers, the priests, and for themselves. So the Israelites, who had returned from the exile, ate it, together with all who had separated themselves from the unclean practices of their Gentile neighbors, in order to seek the Lord, the God of Israel." For seven days they celebrated with joy the Feast of Unleavened Bread because the Lord had filled them with joy by changing the attitude of the king of Assyria so that he assisted them in the work in the house of God, the God of Israel. Friends, this is the culminative event that the people of God have been wanting and waiting for for a long time. And what we have to remember is the reason that this is so important is what? They're finally able to celebrate the Passover. Why is the Passover important? Because years ago, when the people of God were in original captivity in Egypt under Pharaoh, God delivered them the first time. 
And the Passover celebrates essentially what God did to enable them to what? Be free. They're going back and they're remembering and reflecting upon the deliverance of God through his sovereignty, his goodness, and his grace. And so here's what I want to tell you. Remember that amidst the chaos, let's just go there for a minute. I don't know what's going on, God. The world around me is crazy. I see everything that's happening. I see everything that should be good. I see everything that I should understand. It's turned upside down, right side up, over, under. I have no idea what you're doing. And that's what was going on. But God's timing, and that's the next point that I want to tell you, is perfect. Here's what I want to show you, and this is what I want to encourage you in. We read this, and we look at it as, okay, great. On the 14th day of the first month, the exiles celebrated the Passover. Okay, is that just, hey, this is when they did it? They just, you know, okay, we, we figured it out. And, you know, it just so happens to be that now we can do it, and so tomorrow we're going to just randomly celebrate the Passover. I see some heads shaking. No. That's why we need to remember that amidst the chaos, God's timing is perfect. Friends, what we need to remember and recognize is years prior to that, in the book of, Le of Leviticus, the celebration of the Passover was established to be celebrated on the exact day that it was celebrated by the people of God in the book of Ezra. And why is this important? Because in order to maintain the Mosaic law, which is the people of God want to do to honor him, they want to follow the guidelines as displayed in the law through the book of Leviticus. Why is that important? Well, if the book of Leviticus says that the Passover is to be celebrated on said day to honor God, if you miss it by a day, guess what? Got to wait a whole other year. And so what I want to show you is this. People are watching and they're going, God, what are you doing? And we're getting closer and is it going to happen? And if not, can we? And is it going to be a whole nother year before we can celebrate? Are we going to have to wait on you a whole nother year? And why do I want to bring that up? Friends, sometimes when we look at God and we wonder when he's going to move, and we look and we have a timeline in mind and that timeline gets closer and closer and closer and we say, God, are you gonna move or not? Do we trust him to be sovereign, to move when he says he will move? And so what I wanna show you is this. We read on the 14th day of the first month, the exiles celebrated the Passover and we switch over and we read in Leviticus 23, five and six, the Lord's Passover begins at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. On the 15th day of that month, the Lord's Feast of Unleavened Bread begins. For seven days, you must eat bread made without yeast. And so friends, what I want to show you is this, is that Ezra is very purposeful in saying not only did the Passover occur and not only did the festival of unleavened bread happen, but it happened under the sovereignty of God to be according with what God says in his word. Over all of the chaos, over all of what's going on, over all of the things that have happened and all of the things that could cause people to doubt God and his sovereignty, God pulls this off as only he can do. And so lovingly, friends, what I want to tell you as we watch this story, as we see God work, as we walk with him today, wherever we may or may not be, whether we are in chaos, coming out of it, or going into it, I want to encourage you that God's timing is perfect. And let me fast forward that to today. Friends, we look around at what's going on in the world, we see what's happening, and we wonder how much longer, how long, O oh Lord, as we see written by David in the Psalms, how much longer do we have to endure what's going on? When are you going to come? 
And friends, what I can tell you is this, I don't know. I wish I did. I'd be a rich man. But also if I did, I'd be a false prophet. I don't know. But what I do know is he is coming. And he will come. Because he said he will. Just as he sovereignly designs this celebration, he has decreed and sovereignly designs when he will tell his son, go collect your bride. So friends, remember amidst the chaos that God's timing is perfect. The people are able to celebrate Passover as what? Commanded in the Levitical law. And then we get to the actual heart of the celebration. And that's what I want to drive into this morning. We read this, okay? Here it is, on the 14th day of the first month, the exiles celebrated the Passover. And then we see the priests and Levites had purified themselves as and were all ceremonial clean. The Levites slaughtered the Passover lamb for all of the exiles. A little plug, friends, if you're able to come to the Passover Seder. Reverberation to our Savior Jesus Christ. The Passover lamb was slaughtered. What we know as we celebrate the Passover and the Passover lamb as Jesus came is he became our Passover lamb. He's the one that stands in and atones for our sin. At this time, the people of God slaughter the lamb so that their sins might be forgiven, so that they may be purified. They're doing what is commanded according to the Old Testament, recognizing and realizing that in order to do so, they have to go through a series of ceremonial cleanliness, which has a whole nother sermon for another day, but to put some emphasis on there. How many of you like to get squeaky clean in the shower? Okay. How many, after having been squeaky clean, want to like have to go back into the shower like a hundred times and be like examined and looked over to make sure that you've gotten all of the gook, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, out of you? And that if you don't, and you go to worship God and you got a little bit of dirt in your ear, guess what? It's gonna be Indiana Jones all over again. The priests are ceremonial cleansing themselves to move forward in worship, to celebrate the Passover, to offer the lamb, to do what they need to do to make sure that the lamb is clean, that they are clean, they are ready to go. And then watch this. For their brothers, the priests, we're kind of in the middle of uh, verse 20, and for, the, uh, for their brothers, the priests, and for themselves. But then read verse 21, and don't, don't glance over this, okay? So the Israelites who had returned from exile ate it. Awesome. Great. But I love this next part. Together. With all who had separated themselves from the unclean practices of their Gentile neighbors, in order to seek the Lord, the God of Israel. I love that part, and it is so easily overread, meaning we just read it and we don't see what God is doing. And so what I want to show you is this, is that in these moments of chaos, God offers himself as a refuge to all who will come to him in faith. That is saying, I'm here. I am yours. And I want you to come to me and find refuge in me. And anyone who chooses to do so can. And so friends, why am I bringing this up? Because what I see in this is I see the people of God going through chaos, disorder, destructiveness. And I see the people of God having a choice. They can either curse God or they can turn into him. And they turn into him, and as they turn into him, they experience great opposition. 
but they continue to turn into him. And what happens? God honors them, but not only does he honor them, friends, the exiles who left, as we discover in the book, were one number. The exiles who return are a greater number. So number one, amidst chaos, God blesses. But now that the exiles have returned, it's not just for the exiles. It doesn't stop there. It doesn't say only the exiles and nobody else celebrated Passover. What does it say? Together with who? All of the people who came to God and moved from Gentile ways. What does that mean? Because it means that amidst the hardship, the people of God are walking with him and they're telling others about his goodness. The people are looking around and they're saying, your situation is hard. And they're not sitting there going, yeah, it is. It really stinks. I don't know that God's good. We're going through a hard time. He's left us. We've been abandoned. We were sent over here. God isn't there. No, they're saying, you know what? Yeah, it's been hard, but look at what God is doing. And he is faithful. And we're moving forward to honor and bless him. And those people who don't know God are looking, and guess what they're doing? They're saying, we see how hard this is, and we see your faithfulness to him. So there's got to be something to the God whom you worship. So friends, sometimes hard times are the moments when other people who don't know God look at you and they see, yes, it's hard. I'm not saying it doesn't have to be hard. They don't see or they they can see your hurt. Let them see your hurt. Let them see your pain. Let them see your weakness. Why? To show them how strong the God whom you worship is. And then they begin to see, you know what? When we are weak, he is strong. There has to be something to this God. I love this verse because we read over it. We gloss over it. But what we have to understand is when the people of God get back, they endure hardship, they endure opposition, but they remain faithful to God and they trust in him. And other people are observing what's going on. And they look, and they see, and they say, this God must be real. I want him, and guess what? They've come to him, and now what? They too are celebrating the Passover as the people of God. And sometimes the greatest form of evangelism is going through hard times and being faithful to God and having people around you watch your faith and trust in Him. And it pains me because I don't want to stand up in a a, a pulpit and say, bring on the pain. I'm wrong. Because that's exactly what Jesus did. Bring on the pain so that you and I can come to Christ. So friends, in these moments of chaos, God offers himself as a refuge to all who will come to him in faith. And we don't like chaos. We don't like disorder. We don't like hardship, do we? Naturally in ourselves, we want an orderly what? Christian faith. We want to come, we want to worship, we want God to do what he will do when we want him to do it, how we want him to do it, where we want him to do it, and when we want him to do it. And if he does, then God is good and we worship Jesus. But if he doesn't, what do we do? We question him, we wonder, we wonder if he's real, we wonder about his sovereignty, we wonder if he cares, we wonder if he's there. And I'm not saying it's bad to wonder, But perhaps in the wondering, rather than turning away, turn in and realize that even amidst the chaos, God is there. And that within the chaos, the strength of God is demonstrated and proven, which draws us what? To less of ourselves and more of God, which what? Awakens a deeper joy in him. 
Friends, sometimes the path to deeper joy in God comes through pain, brokenness, hurt, destruction, disruption, and confusion. But in that brokenness, disruption, pain, hurt, and confusion, I want to tell you that God has not left you. God is right there. And God is working a manner to demonstrate his love, his mercy, his grace, his sovereignty, and his purpose, and his plan if you are willing to turn to him in faith. So the Israelites who had returned from exile ate it together with all who had what? Separated themselves from the unclean practices of their Gentile neighbors in order to seek the Lord, the God of Israel. The hardship, friends, that the people of God endure because they're remaining faithful to him are evangelistic in their purpose and draw other people to Jesus in his kingdom. And friends, when I look at that, as much as I don't want to endure hardship, I know that it's oh for a little while with what? Placed in the backdrop of eternity. My 48 going on 49 years, Lord willing, maybe 100 when I'm skiing down that run in Jackson and God takes me home is but a glimpse to the glory of God in eternity. And if, Father, I must go through hardship, hurt, pain, brokenness, confusion, disruption, to turn to you to find out how truly weak I am, yet how strong you are, and in that, as people watch my hurt, my pain, my weakness but see your strength and in so doing realize how true and real God is, then may it be so. Because in the end, it's the kingdom of God that life is all about. Friends, in these moments of chaos, God offers himself as a refuge to all who will come to him in faith. Why? Why? Because in verse 22, because God often uses chaos to change our hearts to bring about a greater joy in him and his word. Don't miss the end. Because what's going on in this book right now, these first six chapters are the reordering of the chaos that God's people endured to a new ordering of which... Having been disrupted, God's plan and purpose is for deeper awe, reverence, and joy in him. For seven days, they celebrated with joy the feast of unleavened bread because the Lord had filled them with joy. By what? Changing the attitude of the king of Assyria so that he assisted them in the work on the house of God, the God of Israel. Not a betting man, but if I were, I would say that I would bet that that festival was one of the top festivals celebrated by the people of God. But it took hardship, disorder, and chaos to bring about a deeper joy. And friends, lovingly, what I want to tell you is this. Some of you, I know what you're going through. Some of you, I know the hurts and pains you have. Some of you, I know that they're very, very hard. Some of you, I don't know what pains you may or may not be going through. But what I want to tell you is this. In those moments, trust that God is working. And turn in to him. It doesn't mean that it's easy. You look at the path that the people of God endured. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. But what I am saying is, as you turn into him and find out truly how weak you are, you learn just how great and strong and dependable God is. And the more that you see that, 
the deeper joy you have when you worship him. I want to just throw out a heart check to you, and to be honest with you, I probably should go sit in the pulpit, or not out of the pulpit and in the chair and listen to myself speak. And that is simply this. When you experience hardship, do you turn toward God in faith and experience a deeper joy in Him? Or do you turn away from God and curse Him for your pain? And lovingly, what I want to tell you is don't feel guilty if there are moments where you curse God. But friends, lovingly, don't stay there. We're human. We have those moments where we want to shake our fist. We have those moments where we want to say, God, what are you doing or what are you not doing? But friends, in those moments, then turn to him and say, God, it hurts. I'm in pain. I don't understand. I don't get the chaos. I don't know what's going on, but I trust you, and I know you are there. And I know you are working. And God, in his faithfulness, will bring about a deeper joy. Not happiness. Joy. When we worship him. And that's a good thing. When we look to our relationship with our Savior. We've gone over this and we've basically asked the question, is it possible to experience deep joy when I worship God? And friends, what I want to tell you is yes it is, but be careful for what you ask for. Because sometimes the pathway to deeper joy is through hardship and suffering. But when you're experiencing hardship, remember that amidst the chaos, God's timing is always perfect. And it's in these moments of chaos that God offers himself as a refuge to all who will come to him in faith. Are you seeking refuge in him? Because God often uses the chaos to change our hearts to bring about a greater joy in him and his word. Take home truth, friends, at times the path that leads to deep joy in the Lord must first wind through hardship, opposition, and suffering. And what I want to tell you is simply this. If that's something that you're going through today, lovingly what I want to tell you is this. God hasn't abandoned you. God loves you with an everlasting love. God is there. Turn in to him. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you for the book of Ezra. We thank you for this transitional or pivotal point where the people of God have endured so much hardship by being faithful to you. Father, remind us that really what you are after is a heart of worship for you. But oftentimes, in order to have that heart of worship for you, you have have to take us through hardship and pain. Where in and of ourselves, we recognize our inability, our uh, non-strength of ourselves to understand the true strength of you. And Father, in those moments, I pray that we would just turn to you and ask your hand of guidance and direction that as we do, as you faithfully profess, you will demonstrate your love, your mercy, and your grace to us. Father, thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you that you are bringing about your kingdom through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, until the time that you say it's time for you, Jesus, to go and collect your bride, the church, which is those of us who profess our faith in Christ, may we continue to labor for you. And Father, as we've seen in this word, I pray that you would give us the strength amidst the hardship to praise your name so that others who are looking at us who don't know you would see the authenticity of our faith and that by doing so, as we plant and as we water, those individuals would say, there has to be something real about the God whom you worship and I want to know more. Father, use the hardships to bring about growth of your kingdom, to bring glory and honor to you. We thank you, we love you, 
We pray these things in your name, dear Jesus, and we ask it by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people say,